Making a good movie is hard enough without having to deal with the baggage of what came before, whether a previous version of the film or the source material that inspired it. But sometimes filmmakers feel like they've done it better. And with proud creatives generally being an immodest bunch, they sure as hell wanted you to know about it too, and so had their works basically low-key scream it from the heavens. So join us as we invoke the spirit of Cara Delevingne doing that hilarious you don't have the balls line from Suicide Squad. You're gonna hate me for making you remember that. I'm Ewan, this is What Culture, and here are 10 movies that had the balls to do it better and wanted you to know. Number 10. The Green Knight David Lowry's mesmerizing Arthurian fantasy epic The Green Knight is a bold, spirited adaptation of the 14th century poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. One of those I've always liked, but this Twitter account put it in a way that explained why I enjoy it specifically so much. It's basically a Mike Mignola Hellboy comic in spirit and tone. Great movie. Though Lowry's film is certainly faithful to the spirit and the soul of the source text, it also diverges in some notable ways. Beyond being decidedly more explicit and mature than the poem, it changes the Green Knight into a more feral character. Seguin is aged up, new characters such as the Scavenger are introduced, and the ending is somewhat different. It's a superb film any way you slice it, but Lowry concealed a slightly cheeky nod to the changes he made to the story within the dialogue of the movie itself. At the end of the second act, when Gawain meets the lady, she tells him that her library of books are comprised of stories that she has herself written down after being told them by others. She then tells Gawain, quote, Don't tell anyone this. Sometimes when I see room for improvements, I make them. This is sort of like Lowry winking at the audience and slyly confirming that he tried to improve the original story. And arguably, he absolutely succeeded. Number 9. Goldfinger one of the biggest criticisms about Ian Fleming's Goldfinger novel is that the titular villain's big scheme, Operation Grand Slam, doesn't make a lot of sense. In the book, Goldfinger plots to steal gold from the United States Bullion Depository at Fort Knox. Yet, at the time of its release, many noted the implausibility of anyone attempting to rip off Fort Knox in such a fashion, given the difficulty anyone would have in transporting and storing so much of a heavy metal. As such, the film changes Operation Grand Slam into something much more clever, with Goldfinger instead plotting to detonate a Chinese dirty bomb inside the vault to irradiate the gold inside in turn rendering it worthless for decades and massively inflating the value of his own dastardly gold supply. The movie goes one step further though by literally having 007 state the ridiculousness of Goldfinger's original plan out loud. He tells the villain, quote, 15 billion and gold bullion weighs 10,500 tons. 60 men would take 12 days to load it onto 200 trucks. Now, at the most, you're gonna have two hours before the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines move in and make you put it back. To this, Goldfinger replies, who mentioned anything about removing it before, in typical Bond villain fashion, detailing his decidedly smarter plan. This was nothing if not a brilliant piece of screenwriting, which pithily echoed the vocal criticisms of Goldfinger's paperback scheme while coming up with something considerably better. Number eight, Deadpool. In fairness, neither Deadpool movie has been all that shy about espousing their disdain for Ryan Reynolds' previously bungled, curtailed tenure as the character in X-Men Origins Wolverine, where he better resembled Baraka from the Mortal Kombat games and had his characteristic motor mouth sewn shut. The first Deadpool movie threw some slyer shade at the prior iteration by having an action figure of Baraka Pool visible roughly 30 minutes in, basically nudging the audience in the ribs and telling them, ah, remember that crap. Uh, me neither. But Deadpool 2 went the whole meta hog and took things to a more wonderfully deranged level, as in the mid credit scene, Deadpool uses Cable's fixed time traveling device to track down the Baraka Pool version of himself, interrupt the events of X Men Origins Wolverine, and shoot him dead before Wolverine can get his claws on him. Is there anything ballsier than straight up murdering your lamer prior self to prove beyond any doubt that you've done it better this time? Most movies, of course, can get away with it, but Deadpool's no normal movie franchise. Number 7. Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah 
Giant Monsters All Out Attack It's not exactly a secret that Toho, the Japanese studio behind Godzilla, has a strained at best relationship with Hollywood and its handling of the property, especially Roland Emmerich's widely panned 1998 blockbuster adaptation. And so, 2001's Godzilla, Mothra and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack decided to take an hilarious swipe at Emmerich's movie in its first 90 seconds. In the opening scene, two Japan's self-defense Forces cadets discuss the attack in New York City, that is, the events of Godzilla 98, and one informs the other that the monster involved wasn't Godzilla, despite what the American experts believe. This was the movie very bluntly elbowing Emmerich's film out of the Godzilla canon while still allowing it to exist as a monster movie on its own, just not a Godzilla one. Given that the dinosaur-like design of Godzilla from the 98 movie was one of its most contentious aspects, this was a fun way to toss it aside while basically telling the audience, this is the real stuff right here. And that confidence was certainly well earned, given that this remains one of the most acclaimed Godzilla movies to date. Number 6. Pet Cemetery, 2019 2019's Pet Cemetery adaptation made one major, unexpected change from both Stephen King's novel and the original 1989 movie. Instead of having the Creed family's toddler son Gage be hit by a truck and get killed, it was changed to be their eight-year-old daughter Ellie. Even though some of the movie's trailers pointlessly spoiled this twist, for anyone who went into the film unaware, it certainly made for a tide turning, this ain't your daddy's pet cemetery surprise. More to the point, filmmakers Kevin Kolsch and Dennis Widmeyer didn't just swap the ill-fated child's identity, they followed through with a bewildering fake-out. At first, the scene appears to unfold as previously, with Gage getting ready to be creamed while trying to hug Optimus Prime, but at the last moment, his father Lewis rescues him from the road. At this point, the tanker driver swerves to avoid Gage, causing the vehicle to break apart and be propelled directly towards Ellie, who is also on the road thus killing her. No matter what you make of this new adaptation as a whole, there was a lot of logic to making the dead and eventually resurrected child the older of the two, given how silly the undead toddler came across in the original 1989 movie. Plus, having an older, more experienced child actor play the resurrected kid simply lent it a greater dramatic dimension. By faking the audience out in such a savage way, the filmmakers promised this would be eschewing the silliest part of the previous adaptation. Number 5. Creed. Bloody love Creed. What an amazing movie, and also just R.I.P. Carl Weathers. We miss you loads. From one Creed family to another now, with Rocky spin-off Creed, which focused on the ascent of the late Apollo Creed's son Adonis, played by Michael B. Jordan. Early on, Donnie visits Rocky's restaurant and asks him about training him, to which Rocky is immediately heavily resistant, mentioning that he's been down that road and doesn't do it anymore. This is one of the series' few passing references to its single maligned entry, Rocky V, where Rocky trained a protege, Tommy Gunn, who Rocky ultimately ended up battling in a street fight. A really cool street fight, I should say, but that doesn't necessarily redeem the absolute sadness that occurred before all of it. With Rocky briefly nodding towards his disastrous past as a trainer, this felt like the movie quickly assuring us all that no such nonsense would abound this time, before Creed indeed offered up a infinitely superior riff on the notion of Rocky training another up-and-coming fighter. Basically, the movie is acutely aware, as are we all, that Rocky V wasn't that good, and that Creed wasn't going to be falling into the same melodramatic traps. Beautiful movie, just best legacy sequel ever. Number 4. Starship Troopers I'm doing my part by reading this entry on Starship Troopers out aloud. Great movie. Also, Michael Ironside? No one else could pull off that line of, they sucked his brains out. The coolest dude ever. Agreeing to direct an adaptation of a hit book and then willfully deviating from it is always incredibly risky. Though in the case of Paul Verhoeven's 1997 masterpiece based on Robert A. Heinlein's 1959 sci-fi novel Starship Troopers, he used the opportunity to make it a send-up of every gross idea in the book. Heinlein's original novel remains highly controversial due to the fascisty stuff in it, and though the movie screenwriter Edward Neumeyer originally attempted to adapt it faithfully, once Verhoeven got involved, he insisted that it be reshaped into a satirical deconstruction of military fetishism 
and fascism. The Hoven doing a satire? That should have been easy for everyone to grasp at the time, right? No, actually. Starship Troopers was inexplicably interpreted as a pro-fascist movie upon its original release by dense critics and audiences, but The Hoven really couldn't have made it any more blatant as a neon signposted piss take of military propaganda. Hoven basically got to have his cake and eat it too, making a pulpy sci-fi action flick that also managed to flip the bird at the most toxic views propagated by the original author. Short of having Caspar Van Dyne straight up wipe his ass with Heinlein's novel on screen, what else could he have done here to make this clear? Number 3. Halloween 2018 2018's Halloween reboot Quill marked a high stakes opportunity for Universal to make Halloween cool again, and it all began with clearing the post 1978 canon, including jettisoning Halloween 2's divisive big twist that heroine Laurie Strode, Jamie Lee Curtis, was the sister of Michael Myers, Nick Castle. Early in the film, Laurie's granddaughter, Allison, played by Andy Matichak, talks to her friends about the events of the original film, and when one of them asks about Laurie and Michael being related, she simply replies, No, that's just a bit that some people made up to make them feel better, I think. This was basically director David Gordon Green's politish way of saying, yeah, that silly familial stuff that cursed the franchise forevermore, not doing it. Admittedly, a move like this is decidedly less ballsy when a franchise is already in the toilet, as Halloween categorically was until 2018, but it nevertheless assured fans that the film was tossing out the goofier aspect of the canon and getting back to the lean purity of John Carpenter and Deborah Hill's original masterpiece. Number 2. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is basically the ultimate Spider-Man movie, and it wanted you to know it too. The filmmakers understandably couldn't resist but poking some good-natured fun at one of the most disappointing entries in the series to date, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, which I would contend is not as bad as everyone remembers, but yeah, it's hard to break consensus, so I guess it makes sense here. There's no scene in that movie more infamous than when a symbiote-infected Peter Parker, Tobey Maguire, performs a goofy dance down the streets in New York, and Into the Spider-Verse offers up a hilarious reminder of it in its opening montage. As the original Spider-Man, Chris Pine, brings us up to speed on events, we're briefly shown him strutting down the street as the surrounding New Yorkers look on at him in horror, and Peter says, we don't really talk about this. At once this felt like Spider-Verse taking the mick out of Spidey 3, and also in the process establishing itself as a more superior movie, one with the wit and gumption to even reference the series' prior shortcomings. And truly, Into the Spider-Verse mopped the floor with Spider-Man 3, even managing to juggle a sizable menagerie of villains far more effectively. But if you want my honest-to-god hot take about all this, Spider-Man 3 is in no way the worst Spider-Man movie. Not when Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man No Way Home, which I know you all love, exist. Just give me that original trilogy. Raimi knocked it out of the park. And number one, The Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2. When it came to adapting the back half of the final Twilight books, Breaking Dawn, screenwriter Melissa Rosenberg was faced with a major conundrum. You see, Stephanie Meyer's novel ends on something of an anti-climax, eschewing the expected final battle between the Cullens, their allies, and the villainous Volturi entirely. Well aware that this idea simply wouldn't work cinematically, Rosenberg came up with a rather ingenious compromise, staging a final battle that's simply a premonition of what could happen if the Volturi didn't back down. At the end of Breaking Dawn Part 2, we witness a shockingly brutal final battle with numerous grotesque casualties on both sides, typically of characters who actually survived the novel's end. But at the end of the fight, we pull back and learn that Ashley Green's Alice was simply showing the vision to Michael Sheen, in turn causing him to walk away and ensure the battle never happens. Though to non-readers, it likely felt like a cheap cop-out, it was actually a pretty smart way for the movie to effectively admit that the novel's climax was thunderously lame and offer up something a bit more exciting, even if it never actually transpires in reality. Granted, the truly ballsy thing would have been having the final fight play out for real, but that also would have probably seen literal riots in cinemas worldwide, so I get it.